Welcome to another edition of the SprintCarUnlimited.com Deep Dive presented by Entrust IT Solutions. Joining us on this week's show is former World of Outlaw champion, car owner, and business owner, Jason Myers. Before we get to Jason, don't forget to check out Entrust IT Solutions. Entrust is a full-service technology company serving small and mid-sized businesses in New York, Pennsylvania, and surrounding areas. The staff at Entrust IT Solutions takes a personalized approach to technology. See why customers are choosing Entrust IT Solutions as their technology partner by scheduling a free consultation at www.entrust-msp.com or calling 717-292-8868. Now on with the show. Jason, welcome to the deep dive. It's, we appreciate having you on. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be be here. It's uh, been a while since we've chatted and looking forward to it. Yeah, I guess you're, you you took your son to basketball practice. We have you in the car. The weather looks better here or there than it does in Pennsylvania, that's for sure. Yeah, we've got uh, 75 degrees today, 80 tomorrow, and then we got 55 on Thursday with rain. So we're, we're having a little bit of kind of goofy weather right now, too, which – We've got a race at Plaza Park Friday night, which we're kind of on the fence right now if we're going to get that in or not. So we'll see what happens. Well, the 55 and rainy sounds about right for what what, what we got back here. So <laughs> yeah. you're, you're getting closer. But uh, I want to jump in. You know, you've had a, a star-studded career when you were with the World of Outlaws. But before you got there, how did you kind of get involved in sprint car racing to begin with? Was it something your family was exposed to or you were exposed to growing up and was the world of outlaws where you always wanted to go so exposure wise um we were just fans you know we went to the outlaw race at hanford once a year we used to go to santa maria and uh my, my stepfather who got me into racing you know he got me into go-karts and had me on a three-wheeler when i was three years old and then a motorcycle and we were just kind of gearhead family and um that's what we did for fun. You know, my wife still gives me a hard time today. She said, if it doesn't have a motor on it, I'm not interested in it. And um, so, yeah, whether we go on vacation, I, it used to be really bad. I guess I've grown up a little bit with the kids, but it used to be really bad. Anywhere we went, I wanted to ride something, drive something, do something. And uh, it's just what we did as kids. My family was actually, my stepfather had raced flat track motorcycles when he was in high school. And, uh, you know, so we kind of grew up around that scene a little bit. Used to go to the AMA races in San Jose and um like i said just kind of fans of sprint car racing and i think when i went from go-karts into the into the micro midgets um it was kind of just the natural progression i had a lot of success in that we loved it we'd been going to the sprint car races and um, i looked at different stuff you know i used to race with matt crafton and karting and, and micros and he went on to the southwest tour series and so we kind of looked at that a little bit and um just chose the sprint car path and Got hooked up with Don Barry here in Selma. A friend of mine introduced me to him and um, just kind of one thing led to another. Got, you know, Jimmy Sills was driving for Don Barry at that time. So uh, Jimmy was great, kind of took me under his wing a little bit, as well as Don and his entire team and helped us get started. And kind of, I guess the rest is history. You know, it's like, and, and I don't know, I think as a competitor in anything you're doing, you want to be the best at it. And when you go for micros, the next, you want to be the best. And the next step would be a sprint car. And if you're going to do that, then you want to be an outlaw. And just, you know, one thing to the next, to the next. You know, you ended up, you ran the outlaws, I guess, with the 20 cars, a DOCC car in 2001. But how, before that, how did running in California prepare you for the road? Because I know I look at it now. And I think your best drivers on the road are, are are from California. We see that with Brad and and other guys who've come out. Was it the same way back then that running in California really prepared you for the road itself? Well, I think you know at the end of the day, there's there's the outlaw tour and then there's the road, and that's really two different things. Um, preparing point. for the road, you know, that's. That's one thing I talk to any driver that I mentor or even when I'm mentoring somebody in business now and talk to them about what I used to do. If, when you get out on the road, you know, and, and especially your first three, four years, you don't know anybody. You don't know where you're going. You're reading. You know, when I started, we were reading maps. Nobody reads a map anymore. But, um, <clears throat> you know, you had to figure out where you were going every day. You didn't even know where to go for lunch. Like it's 
it's different when you're home and you know these places and you know these things and things that you don't have to think about. And then you get out on the road and it's totally different. And, um, you're in laundry mats and all that type of stuff. So, um, you know, I think California. So obviously, if you if you look at the United States and you look at sprint car racing, I think it can be argued for years that California, Pennsylvania and Ohio ha- are kind of the three hotbeds of sprint car racing. And the difference that California has is it doesn't pay enough to stay here and do it. So you can be in Pennsylvania. There's great drivers in Pennsylvania, but they're doing well enough staying right at home that they don't need that. The the decision to go and travel is far and few between. It's only the ones that really, really want to have a career. Or I shouldn't say have a career that they really, really want to be an outlaw because there's several drivers that have had great careers just being a posse member. And you can look at Ohio. There's several drivers that you can you can have a regular job. You can race on the weekends and do really, really well. And uh, or it can be, you know, you look at Chad Kimenaugh and all the success he had over the years right out of Ohio. So um, there's so much racing and the purses are pretty good. Where California, there's very competitive racing. However, the purses have never been that strong um, until maybe even just maybe the last four or five years with some things that Kevin Rudin and Peter Murphy are doing. And uh, prior to that, though, other than the outlaw shows coming through town, there wasn't much that really paid that well to where. You could do it on the weekends. I mean, you had to have a regular job. I mean, there's plenty, plenty of very successful racers that race primarily in California. You know, Ronnie Day and and uh, Tim Green, who he spent some time on the road, but primarily here in California, Brent Cading and, uh, and then Bud Cading and quite a few drivers. So, but they've all got regular jobs and they're just racing on the weekends. And there's typically one, maybe two races on a weekend. It's not like Pennsylvania where you can run four or five nights a week. So, um preparation wise though like i did have guys out here that i learned to race against like i mean when i started racing you had tim green jimmy sills brent kading ronnie day like these are these are guys that are in the record books that we were racing again night in and night out and getting our lunch handed to us so you know it it really i think racing against those guys that they had all been out on the road they had all done that and had come back and you know had careers here in california and get, getting to race against those guys on, you know, there's only one half mile track in California, which they're not even racing at now. So your biggest racetrack anymore is Hanford. But when you learn how to race on the, the bull rings of California that in my day were very sticky, very rough, um, like there was no breaks. You know, there you get on a half mile, like there's there's calmness you know, even down the straightaway and even, and even through the turn for that matter. But when you're on a little tiny bull ring, like it's stomp and steer nonstop. This guy's coming at you this direction and that direction, or you're bouncing through a rut or up against the fence. And so I think it really helps with your reactions and your, uh, your, your endurance and just the things, you know, things that prepare you for, you know, I, I think a California guy can leave California and go to, um, Pennsylvania and compete I think a pencil guy Pennsylvania guy comes to California is like you guys are you're retarded out here like I mean what do you this is this is ridiculous so um you know and I I can't I won't say that you can go to Ohio because going to the slick tracks of Ohio and figuring that out is a whole nother scene um but I think really it's just you know iron sharpens iron and when you're racing against great racers like i got to race against and and even now that you know you see kyle and and brad and and rico and you know these guys grew up racing against each other making each other better you know the first year you wouldn't race your first year which that not a lot of rookies do that but then you go back to kws in 2002 what led to that so for me um I ran the gum the gum out tour came along in 2000 and we, I actually went out and ran the gum out tour. So that was my first year on the road. We got to run a handful of outlaw shows along with that. And then I got the opportunity with Craig Cormac mm-hmm. and uh, you know, Craig had a great team. It was one of the top teams on the tour and getting that opportunity to go out and run that first year and have the, have some success like we did. I mean, we had plenty of tough nights too, but we definitely had some success and um that so Craig's team folded up at the end of the year. He folded his team up and and um, decided to not own a team anymore. So it really left me without a ride going into 2002. 
Um, I did a small stint with Junior Holbrook at the beginning of the year. Yep. Um, I'm sorry. I did the small stint with Junior Holbrook at the beginning of 01, actually, before I got the DOCC car ride. And then, um, so 2002, really just, I didn't have a ride. You know, I didn't have a ride to be on the Outlaw Tour. Um, I had some opportunities back home with my my stepfather's business to come home and be a part of that. And uh, so I kind of just came back home, regrouped. Um, I had just gotten married. I got married at the end of 2001. And uh, yeah, I, I don't honestly know. I can't remember why those thoughts were at that point, other than I, I didn't have something to step right into and go to. So we decided we'd run the family car around home, run the outlaw races that we could. And uh, we did go to Knoxville that year with that, with our own car. And so we got out on the road a little bit and um, then, and actually that's when I met Guy, right? So, so that's when Guy Stockbridge and I met at the end of 2002 and put our program together for 03. So I don't know, maybe, you know, why did I do it? It's the choice that I had at the time. It was the best choice I had. And apparently I would say, if you look at how it all unfolded, I'd say it was meant to be. Before you meet Guy, was there a point there where you were scared you wouldn't get back? Um, I don't know that I was scared that I wouldn't get back. It was just a matter of that might be a reality that I didn't get back. Um, I had really decided at that point, as we rolled into 2003 and Guy and I started racing together, our intent was not to go. We didn't have an intention to go out all out racing. We were putting something together to race here in California. I was working in the family business. And uh, just gotten married, building my first home. Like I was, I, I you were busy. basically, I, I, yeah, build, busy. And, but I think I had really just decided at that point that, well, I guess we're going to the backup plan because that didn't work out. Um, I don't know that I was sitting here. I honestly can say I wasn't on the phone every day trying to find an outlaw ride or trying to do anything like that. I was enjoying what I was doing at that time. So um, then circumstances, uh, or I guess by, other things happen to change that. Yeah. You get a call. Uh, Greg Delansky gets injured. You go out on the road, I guess, in 2003. You sub for him most of the year, I would say, or the better part of the year. And then the following year, elite racing. And you're back out on the road. Uh, that transition to getting back on the road in your own deal, how does that come about? Because it was going to be California still. Yes. Yeah. So I... um so Guy and I started racing together, and then I get that call in May from on a Sunday morning from Craig and Scott, and uh, Craig had been injured in the Indy Light stuff that he was doing, and they asked me to come out and fill in. So I went to my parents, and you know it was kind of like, wow, I'm getting another shot at this. And uh, so went to my parents, talked about, you know, hey, I'm kind of I'm running the family business at this point, and I think they were enjoying, you know, obviously there was a piece of them that was enjoying that, and. Um, and then also I had this new relationship with Guy with this great race team we had built. I got a lot of great people on the team that are, you know, good friends and still to this day, good friends. And, and um, went to all of them and said, I got this call and of course I'd like to do it, but I'm not going to leave everybody hanging either. And, and uh, I want to talk to you all about it. Everybody was extremely supportive of it. Obviously my parents were very supportive um, Preston and Eddie and all the guys on the team. And Guy told me, look, like you got to do it. All I ask is we've made these commitments to sponsors, like help me find somebody to put in the car while you're out there doing that. So uh, we called Rondy Day up and shook him out of retirement. He got in the <laughs> car and um, he still blames us to this day for that. And um, then went out on the road and, you know, really just Craig and, and Scott had an amazing team that they had put together, both with the, both with staff and with uh, equipment. And, you know, got to work with DJ Lindsay. That's where DJ and I yep. met. We just hit it off right out of the gate and had a lot of success. We won seven races that year. Um, and you're right. We did run most of the year. Craig came back right at the end of the year when he got cleared. And um, Scott actually helped Guy and I uh, um, with some support to be able to bring our car out on the road so I could finish the season. And, uh, yeah, it I – that led us to, to Guy and I at the end of the year, like, well, we can't stop now. Like, look at the success we've had. Like, let's figure this out. Let's find a way. And so we started elite racing at that point. And then we went to work. We went to work shaking the trees and, and trying to jam up what sponsorship we, any sponsorship we could and any support that we could get. And, and in the course of about right at December 31st, we made the decision. I think if I remember right, we had built a budget 
that we knew we had to get to. And we were within like maybe 50 grand of the budget. And I'm like, we'll figure it out. It's yeah, close enough, know. right? Like we'll <laughs> figure it out. So we made the decision right at January 1, like, okay, let's do this. And we started ordering parts and going crazy. And I'll never forget, two weeks later, I get a call from Al Hamilton and says, I'd like you to come out and drive my car. You can run any race you want to run. I'll give you all the best equipment. All I ask is that you race Friday night at Williams Grove. And I'm like, you know, what are the chances, right? And <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, Al, like, I would love to do this, but I I – two weeks ago made the decision that, Hey, I'm building this race team. I signed up sponsors. Like I'm committed. I, you know, I can't go back on that. I've got to do what I said I'm going to do. I've already committed to these people and uh, never thought I would have been turning that down. And uh, you know, I got to know, I went on to get to know Al over, over the years and just what a, what a neat human being. And, oh, yeah. and uh, you know, even though I never wound up driving for him, I was able to build a relationship with him. And, and that means a lot to me that he called and, you know, that's something that happened. You know, that's funny. That's like, you know, you like a girl, then you start dating another girl and then <laughs> the girl comes back. What it, it always happens. That's yeah, a, very true. <laughs> you know, so, so the, you're ninth in uh, 2003, fifth in 2004, you're second in points in 2005. You got behind Steve Kinzer. You guys, people might not think three years is quick, but it really is in sprint car racing, especially when you're running against the world of outlaws and guys like Steve Genzer and, and all the names who were running the series back then. What was the key to you guys kind of being on that expressway to success so early on in your career with the world of outlaws? Um, You know, we, we just, um, I think, you know, guy and I really hit it off. Well, we both believed in the same thing of, you know, putting, the best equipment together that we could. And we just, we worked really, really hard at it. Steve Swenson was my crew chief those years, um, those first two years. And um, Steve and I, we had, uh, I had uh, a few different guys on the crew during that time. Bob Curtis started with us, Brian Sunby. Yep. Uh, and then uh, John Pate joined us. And I can't believe, I can't remember if Brian joined us. Brian didn't join us till a little bit later, I don't believe. Uh, maybe sometime in 05, I think actually. And uh, I just had, I had good people. I had good support. And um, I think I took to the half mile racetracks really well. And, um, you know, it was, I don't know. It was just the experiences that I had. And we, uh, you know, when I look back at that now too, and look at like, who we were racing against. I mean, my first four years on the road, four years, five years from 01 to 05. I mean, Mark Kinzer, Stevie Smith, Jack Hoddenshield, they're all still racing. Um, and you're racing against, you know, you go through that list of names, like those are the names of the world of outlaws out, you know, outside of your Rick Furkles that had retired at that point. But, um, and Steve Kinzer was arguably, in his third or fourth prime that he had in his career. Right. I mean, he was really, really strong at that point. Um, even in the six again, really, really strong. And their, their stuff was really good. So, um, I, I had a lot of great help, you know, guys like Scott Gherkin were very good to me. Um, you know, when Annie Hilberg was racing, diesel was really good to me. I, at Mark Ellis, when we first got on the road, like I just had, um, a lot of good mentors that gave me a lot of good advice and, and, um, we worked hard at it. We worked really hard at it. You know, then you have the year with NST, which I'll get to in a, a little bit later, as as you can probably imagine. You come back to the Outlaws, you go fifth, second, second to to Donnie. And I thought this the second time you finished second to Donnie was like 19 points. Yeah, ridiculous. <laughs> before before I get to the how close it was when you're going through through those two seasons where you're following Donnie, what did you feel at that point you needed to get over the hump? Because this was, a, you know, the third time you finished second, you know, Steve and then Donnie, two of the, probably the best ever at this point, if we look at Mount Rushmore. Um, was there something missing? I, I know I've heard a lot about your mental game, so to speak. You, if I'm not mistaken, did you see a sports psychologist? You were really into the mental part of of sprint car racing 
So I was later in my career. So yes, uh, you know, running second to Donnie two years in a row. And in 2008, we like, I think we won 10 or 11 races that year, which is not, you know, there's guys that have done 20 race seasons, of course. And, um, and Steve had even larger thing, but in the modern era, right. 20 is kind of the number. And, and uh, we won 10 or 11 races that year, but we had, we had a string of like 23 races where we didn't finish off the podium. We finished the top three, 20, not three nights in a row. Wow. And, and our average finish that year, that was that year, even in my championship years, 2008 was my best average finish year. I think it was in the fours and we still didn't win the championship because while we had an amazing year, Donnie had a Cinderella year <laughs> and, and still beat us. Right. And so, um, 2008 still to this you know still in my career was my best average finish that year and we didn't win the championship um, we actually won the championship with around like a f- five two five three average finish I think in both 10 and 11 so after finishing you know second two years in a row like in my opinion I had a great team I had great equipment um, I had great support I felt like my skills you know my fitness my health my time on the road my experience and knowledge was there And it was kind of like, well, what, what is missing? And what we identified at that point was every year you have a slump, like every year you have a, you have four weeks where for whatever reason you run bad one night or you crash a car and you rebuild another one. And then you, you struggle. And then, and then you get to going back and forth of not knowing which side's up and takes you three weeks before you figure out that you had a bad torsion bar or, or, you know, something, right. Something. And or you just get over yourself and try to stop trying so hard and and things turn around. And um, basically, we looked at it like, okay, like, look, we lost this championship by 19 points. All we have to do is make that slump for, you know, six races long instead of seven or that one night that we fell out because something happened or that one crash or that one, you know, some of that stuff you really can't avoid. But we just looked at if we can just improve a couple nights, right. Those nights when we were bickering back and forth about what to do instead of staying focused, right. How do we fix that? And so at that point I did, I reached out to Fresno state here at home and asked if there was somebody that I could study sports psychology with. And uh, they introduced me to a professor there at the school, Tim Hamill. And uh, to this day, Tim and I are very good friends. Tim actually works in my business here 12 hours a week on top of his teaching um, that he does at Fresno state. And, uh, I just studied sports psychology with him. He gave me stuff to read. We went through, I mean, he didn't know anything about sprint car racing when he met me. And, and uh, we come out in 2010 and 11 to win the championship back to back. And it really, I can remember coming, you know, I, I did all the studying and then I would sit down with the team and be like, okay, so here's something I want you to, I, I would basically teach class at the shop. Right. And I, I can remember DJ's face being beat red. Like this is the <laughs> dumbest shit I've ever heard. And what are we doing? Right. And, and and the younger guys, I had Glenn Beaton and Brian Bloomfield at that time, like they really took to it. And DJ did too, but it would be two weeks later, he'd be like, so that thing you said the other day, right? <laughs> That's what you were talking about. And, but at first, you know, it was, we got motors we could be working on. We got cars we could be working on. What are we doing? And and um, I think it just, you know, it, it, it helped us to look at things differently. It helped us to look at struggle differently. It helped us to, uh, you know, embrace struggle instead of fight it and really take the, and use every night as a, I still say this in my business, like, I don't care that we won last night. Like, that's great. How do we get better today? Right. I mean, let's, let's win, let's celebrate it. Now let's go to work. And, and the, and on the bad nights, like I used to tell the guys and I tell people now, like, look, I, I don't mind that you get upset. I'd actually be a little worried if you didn't get upset. It might mean that you don't care, but get upset and let's get over it. And let's use that energy to get better tomorrow. Let's fix it. Whatever it may be, whether it's our attitudes, the car, whatever we need to do, better communication. Let's take this energy that we have, which is anger at this point, and let's turn it into something positive. And those are things that, you know, I learned and, and Tim coached me on and and uh, not only served me in racing, but continues to serve me today. Both serves me in business, serves me with my wife, serves me with my kids. It serves me just as a human being, which I think is the coolest part about it. Well, those two championship years. It wasn't close. The championship wasn't close. Uh, I remember those two years, just I, I'm old, so I covered that. But, um, you know, I look back and and 
obviously over the years you for, you forget. I forgot that you kind of ran away a little bit, and especially the second one. What was that experience like? Because again, you're beating a Mount Rushmore guy. I mean, obviously people maybe didn't think that back then, but come on, Donnie wasn't going anywhere. You beat a guy. I mean, and you kind of got away from him both seasons. I mean, it, you have to look back at that in that team and be in awe of what your team accomplished. Yeah, I, I'm very proud of what our team did and and everybody that was involved. And, and I think one of the one of the key parts of that is if you look at all of the members that were on the team in those years, so DJ Lindsay, Brian Bloomfield, Shane Bowers, Glenn Beaton, all of them went on to be crew chiefs. When, when I retired and shut things down, they all went on to be crew chiefs. All, I mean, DJ obviously already was, Brian was, but Glenn went to Australia and had a ton of success. Shane Bowers went off with multiple drivers, Brian Clausen being one of them and had great success. Yep. And now he's back yep. working with our team, having a lot of success with Corey. And um, so that shows the type of talent that we had involved with the team. And we had Charlie Garrett, who an amazing, you know, just an amazing engine builder, amazing guy. Charlie wasn't just our engine builder. Charlie was part of the team. And, you know, I tell people all the time that you bought the motors from Charlie, but they weren't really your motors. Like no. those were his babies, right? And you may have paid for them, but they were his. And, uh, but the great thing about Charlie too is, you know, we'd have a meeting and be talking about things and he'd be like, well, what do I need to do to make the motors better? And I think the what we had going for us is rather than blame the engine or blame this or blame that, like we were all humble and willing to say like, Charlie, it's not the engine. There's nothing wrong with the engine. Like we just got to get it together. We're not making the right decisions. We're not getting the car right. And, you know, don't go change something that doesn't need changing. Let us get our car right. And then he'd turn around and say, well, let's talk about your car. What's going on with your car? And he's a smart guy. Right. So we, we would have those conversations. And I use that example a lot in business anymore. When I tell people that in business, in the construction business that I'm in, your CPA, your insurance agent, your bonding agent, and your banker, they need to be part of the team, not just a service provider. Like they got to get you, they got to understand you. They got to, they got to speak a similar language, you know, in, in their field. But I want all of those people to be team members, not just service providers. And that really comes from what I saw with Charlie Garrett of, he didn't just build our engines. He didn't just rebuild our engines. He was part of the team. It mattered to him how we ran. Um, it wasn't just, we weren't just a customer and, you know, those last couple of years we'd actually contracted him to work just for our team. But even in the previous years we'd work for him, like we weren't just a customer to him. And he was like that with all his teams. And, uh, he was a really big part along with guys, you know, Steve and Steve and Kent who were building our chassis that we designed together. And, um, we just, we had a lot of great partners that we put everybody together. And I think we had a great group of humble people that, you know, everybody's got an ego, but this team had controlled egos and worked together and worked together for the greater good. And I really think that's what created um, the success that we had those years. Well, I'm going to get to how you kind of people is a big thing to you, who, you know, how you treat people, how people, uh, you know, putting good people together. I'll get to that in a minute. So you, you make the decision to retire. And unfortunately for you, it was right around the Chris Luck thing for people who don't know he was involved in the team. He got arrested, indicted, uh, a Ponzi deal. And, but I think what people don't realize when they talk about this is your kids were about to go to school. Can't go into school on the road, you know, you know, homeschooling wasn't a big deal with 2012 as much as it is now. What was that whole experience like from the retiring to everything that was going on with Chris and all the stuff that was kind of, you were getting bombarded with that over that time period? It was a lot, you know, I mean, you, uh, you look back at it now and I've been through, you know, lots of things. This is, we're talking 10, 12 years later, but at that time I was 32, 33, I think. And, and, and even though, you know, 32, 33 is not young, but when you've lived in the world of outlaw yeah. bubble for 10 years, let's be honest, like you haven't experienced much outside of racing. life on the roads full of experiences and things, but it's just racing. You're, you're kind of in a bubble, you know, and, 
And uh, of course, that time, that's before social media, that's before the world's so interconnected the way that it is now. And it seems crazy to say that 10 years ago, the world was that much different, but it really was. And, um, you know, I used to have to call my wife after the races and tell her I was okay. There was no dirt vision when I first started, you know, 15, 20 years ago either. So, um, you know, making that decision was a really, really tough decision. So ultimately, you know, we had some plans. I had planned to race one more full-time year and, uh, Delaney was going to start school after that. And when my wife and I had kids, we told ourselves that, okay, you got, I got five years to, either get to the next level of NASCAR where we can fly home after the races every Sunday, or we'll make a career change at that time. So um, our plan was to go home at the end of third or the end of 12 would have been. And um, cause Delaney was going to start school. She would have started school kind of in 2012 during the season, but um, something, you know, at the end of the, at the end of the 2011 season, we were, we were looking at starting another another team and making it a two car team. We'd been working on some things for that, and there were just some things through that whole process that went awry that were uncomfortable uh, between Chris and I and Guy. And ultimately, we made the decision of, hey, like I don't necessarily need a two car team. This is you know this is my career. This is not just something that's fun for me. Um, I do enjoy it, obviously, but it's my this is my career. This is how I make a living. And so we kind of came to a point where you know, I'd rather just do what I'm doing with, with elite racing that guy and I started from the beginning, Chris. And if you want to start another team, then you go right ahead and and do that. And uh, so ultimately, um, you know, uncomfortable situation. We had, we had done a lot together, very, you know, uncomfortable, but we, we worked through it and kind of worked it out. And, you know, Chris went off and did his own thing um, with Chad and uh, guy and I went back to like, all right, it's just me and you again. What are we going to do? Um, that was in December of 2012 or I'm sorry, 2011. So at that point we had some thinking to do, we had just put a deal together, um, with a, with a major, um, a major brand really was going to be a kind of our first full on, you know, branding corporate sponsorship. And we were, when I say put it together, like it was all agreed to, like it was one signature away from being done. And, um, I had to call them up and say, Hey, hold on a minute. Like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next year. And um, so, so that was tough. There was a, there was 30 days right there. And I actually had gone to Australia to race that year. So for 30 days in Australia, I, my wife and I contemplated this back and forth every day and made phone calls every day about what we were going to do. And, and on, you know, and so I'm racing in Australia and then I'm staying up till five, six in the morning because that's, or, or vice versa. I can't remember what it was, but right to get the time here when I could yeah. talk to people. And uh, so working through that while we were over there and ultimately I came to the decision of at the end of this season, I'm going to go home and start a new life, right? That had pretty much been decided that Delaney's going to start school. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go to plan, you know, the next, the next, not plan B, but really just the next chapter of my life. And, start a business and, you know, do something different. And, uh, Steve Kahn, who I was driving for at that time, great guy and was, you know, a good, a good mentor to me at that time. And we had a lot of conversations about what to do and, and where to go as well as with many other great people that I had around me in my life. And, um, all of our partners that were part of the team, like ultimately I had talked to several of them and they said, Hey, like, we'll respect any decision you make. You know, it's, this is your life We're we've enjoyed the ride and what we'd enjoy to keep going on this ride with you, or we'd support you in your own, in your decision. And, uh, that, so that part of that part of that situation, while it was hard, was really, really neat. And I'll cherish that forever. It showed me the type of people that we had surrounding us, right. This team of people that we had built, that was hundreds of people from, every sponsor that was on the car, every product person we worked with, every, uh, just every supporter we had, not, not just the team members, but every single person that was involved with elite racing and, um, ultimately made the decision of when Robin and I, you know, basically Robin and I did, we worked our tails off to build elite racing guy was a big supporter, but he had a business to run and we were on the road and building not only the Jason Myers brand, but also the elite racing brand and building the team and hiring the people and, we kind of looked at each other and said, you know, we didn't have kids when we did this. And if we're going to sit here and try to rebuild, we're going to sit here and spend all this time rebuilding over the next few months, all just to to wrap it up nine months from now. So it's going to take us nine months to rebuild. 
we I don't know that we can even build it the same way we built it from the beginning um, because we have two kids now and that wouldn't in while we know that we could it with at what cost right at what sacrifice to our family and to our kids or we could go home and put all that energy into building the next chapter of our life that is forever versus hey let's we just want to race one more year so let's do that and um so i think personally for us you know really that answer became very clear but then it wasn't that wasn't the end of the decision because now you have to call all these people that have been a part of what you're doing and you felt like you were disappointing them right and um that being said i can say that out of the 60 phone calls i made 59 of them were positive and and even the one that was a little bit negative was you know we're still friends to this day and it was more of a more of a disappointment really than mm -hmm. than being disgruntled and um so you know that that led me to to come back home at that point and uh you know there's some conversations with tom and tommy tarleton who really tommy's good has was a good friend at that time and is a great friend now we've raised our families together and uh you know i was able to come home and and race with them a little bit for the next few years and it really it really all came together. I was able to go to Australia and race with Steve Kant and uh, help them with, you know, his, his, both his sons have raced now, his son Lachlan's still racing. So, you know, we were able to get through all that. I was able to go home, get started in business. And uh, really I spent the next six months. We did, we did race part of that season. We ran the first 14 races of the season and then uh, with elite racing. And then we wrapped it up and, and uh, moved on to the next chapter. And, you know, as tough as as tough as the stuff with Chris was at that point, you know what what happened five months later was I, I'll never forget when that when that news broke and that happened. It was like, oh my gosh, like you know, had I, re I really thank God for the fact that some things you know some things with the two car team had gone awry the year before that that kind of broke us up because man, had I been sitting in, sh in Charlotte, that that happened at Charlotte. I would have been sitting at Charlotte on TV and that happened. And it was tough enough as it was because people are going to say what they're going to say and think what they're going to think and, and um, what it is. But, you know, I got that news the same way everybody else got it. And um, it was, it was surprising and, um, and then sad, just sad and, but, but difficult on our side because of, you know, I'm not a big social media person. I don't follow it. I don't look what people read, but still. Ooh, that thank God you didn't have, have it. <laughs> right. And and that, but that doesn't mean I don't have friends of like, oh, you should have seen what this guy said and that guy said. And it's like, you know, I don't, I know what my friends are saying. I know what, I know the people that know me, what they know. Right. And, and know that, um, you know, not only did I have nothing to do with it, didn't know anything about it. And, and, uh, it's unfortunate, you know, really, really unfortunate. And, um, you know, a sad thing for a lot of people. So obviously you have no regrets about the way your career ended. Uh, you don't seem like a guy that, that has many regrets about the decisions you make. You have good people around you. This carried into business, Myers Constructors Incorporated. Uh, and then you raced a little bit, like you said, but then you get kind of hooked up with the Corey. Day. How do you end up with Corey Day? or working with Corey Day and that whole situation. I'm assuming it's back to Ronnie, but I'm going to let you tell it. Yeah. So, you know, my intent when I, when I left racing, Steve, when Steve and I were in Australia and we were talking about, okay, like I'm going to wrap up, this is going to be it. Steve told me, he said, look, go home, work your butt off for five years and then come back and own a team. Like you can still be involved in the sport. Right. So I did. I think that was great advice. I did. I went home. It took me almost, nine years to get back to that point. Um, during that time, we kind of always had some stuff. I kept racing a little bit till 2018. And yes, like I've known Corey since he was born. I mean, we were, Ronnie was driving for us when Corey was born. We've all been there since that time. Um, when I came home off the road, Corey was, so what is he? He's 18 now. So he would have been around seven years old or so when I came home. And, uh, you know, he would be over at our house on his little KTM jumping the doubles at seven years old, you know, and, and the kids just always had a real natural feel for whether it's a motorcycle, a race car, whatever it be. And, and, uh, so we, you know, we spent 
some time around him and, and obviously our relationship with Carol and Ronnie were good friends. And, and, um, and then what really happened is it's probably been seven years now, maybe eight years, Ronnie and Carol actually moved to Fresno. Um, they came to Fresno here. Ronnie came and went to work for John Lawson and they moved here. And, um, then they, uh, then they started their own trucking company. And so then we started spending a lot of time around them and a lot of time around Corey. And then Corey got a micro here with Jake Agopian, who, you know, Jake's dad, Mark was a mentor to me and good friend. And, and Jake and I are really close now. And so he started running the micros and racing around home here. So we, we were involved in that a little bit and kind of paying attention to what he was doing. And, and, uh, then, uh, my nephew was racing micros too. So we'd be at the track from time to time. And, and, uh, we actually, I actually put Jake. So when I decided not to drive the sprint car anymore, that HP and myself were, were fielding, we decided that we would put Jake in and give Jake a chance. So Jake drove for us for, I think that basically it was a year and it was during the COVID year when he kind of got the short end of the stick. A lot of races got canceled and stuff, but you know, this is when Corey, Corey was still young and he was running. Carol had bought some sprint car stuff and he was dabbling in it a little bit. And, and, uh, we were kind of like, ah, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see where he goes. And most young drivers go in and tear a bunch of stuff up. Right. So it's kind of like, yeah, let mom and dad pay for that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure this out. And, uh, Peter Murphy called me one day and, uh, you know, Preston and I were kind of doing the car together and, and helping, you know, Preston and I've been friends for gosh, 25 years now. And, and um Preston's been real successful in his business too. And so we were we were we were doing this stuff together and and um decided that um you know Peter Murphy called and he said, What are you guys doing? Like, why do you not have Corey Day in the car? Like he's the real thing. And like, well, you know, he's still really young and right. So we uh we took him to Phoenix. We decided that we were gonna give him a shot. We took him to Phoenix and went and ran Larry was at uh I don't know if that was January, February, when it was, I think it was like January. They had that race three or four races out in Phoenix and most of the outlaws were there. And we went out there and like, he just did a hell of a job. I mean, first time in a four ten goes out, he's running and he's slide job and Donnie shots in the heat race. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Donnie and I were fierce competitors for a year. I mean, I gotta, I gotta be honest. Like I was cheering him on a little bit, you know? And, and, uh, I remember everybody saying at the end of the night, like Donnie's got to be thinking like that damn 14 car again. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> and, um, and what I was impressed was more than, more than anything. And we told Corey when we went, I said, look, like I'm a worker. I've always had to work hard for what I got. And this, this isn't going to be a show up in your sunglasses with your helmet bag and drive the car. Like you're going to the car wash, you're working on the car. Like this is how you earn the respect of your team and people. And, and he was, he was, you know, he, did everything we asked and drove the hell out of the race car. And, and I was really impressed with how he could get out of the car at his age and talk about, I feel, I feel like the right front's doing this and or the left rear's doing this. And, and, you know, that was close to my heart because that's how I was as a driver. You know, I wasn't a, I wasn't a driver that got out of the car and says it's tight or loose. Like I got out of the car and I, I knew how to work on my car. My stepfather was adamant that you got to know what you're doing. And um, so I appreciated that about Corey, that he was, that he was intelligent, right? He wasn't just a race car driver, right. he's an intelligent race car driver. And um, so, yeah, one thing led to another, you know, we put him in the car the next, that, that year. And, and uh, he's just, he surprises us every time we turn around, you know, he's just, he's done a great job. He's putting the work in. He's, I got him working with Tim Hamill, who I worked with on the, on the psychology side. We got him, we, asked him to be in the gym. Like we gave him stipulations of like, Hey, if we're going to make these investments and do these things and, and, and also spend our time, like both Preston and I got families. So if I'm at the racetrack, that means I'm not with my wife. I'm not with my kids. I mean, even though they come from time, sometimes, sometimes I'm missing a basketball game because we were doing that. So uh, with that, you know, he did his part too. And here we are, you know, and, and to be honest, we didn't plan on running the high limit deal either this year. And then we're working on things and, you know, kind of the schedule came out and the payouts came out. It's like, we got to do this. I mean, he's, and it was the question on, is he ready though? Right. And so we sat down with Ronnie and Carol and, and, and asked, and then we sat down with Corey and said, like, we think we should go do this. We're willing to make this investment, Preston and I, and the other supporters on that are part of the team. And, and um, he agreed to go do it. So here we are. 
I think he's one of the top five talents I've seen since 1985, which, I mean, he's really good. His car control, I think, his way through a race. He definitely has no problem passing cars. Um, so that being said, he's what is, he sucks at qualifying, though. <laughs> well, yeah, well, if he, you know what, if he ca- gets better at that, he can be like Brent Marks and make $630,000 once he gets it. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we're working on the qualifying thing. <laughs> So you, you actually answered a bunch of questions there. High limit. You're a sprint car guy. You, you've been around for a while. How's high limit different than NST? You ran NST. Now, I have my reasons why I think it's different, but what are your thoughts? Well, the, the difference is, you know, it's different because the times are different. You know, with having, with having flow behind it, um, Fred Brownfield was a dear, dear friend of mine. I loved him you know, like a father, great guy, great mentor to me. And, um, I would have followed Fred anywhere. And, uh, that was more, you know, the NST was bootstrapped. It was a guy with a passion that you, that he had everybody's trust and, and you knew that Fred, you know, had Fred not passed away, that would have worked out differently because Fred wouldn't, Fred wouldn't have given up. Like Fred would have got there. It would have taken a while, but he would have got there. So, The similarities in this right now is Brad Sweet. Brad Sweet's a hard worker. Brad Sweet's a talented kid that works hard. Like I remember Brad sleeping on people's couches in Indiana, driving driving any shitbox he could find, (laughs) and and look at where he is today. And he's worked hard for it. So that's there's a similarity. The difference is you've got flow behind it that has not just financial presence, but also the infrastructure of the, the marketing, the media, the streaming, all of the things that go along with it that you need to be able to create a successful business. And it's already there. It's already built in. They're plugging this into that. And then you got, you got Brad and then you got Kyle, who has been probably, if not the best, definitely one of the best ambassadors for open wheel racing um, and grassroots racing and in history done a great job and um and then you got brad who not only is a champion in his own right and a great race car driver but a great guy and a hard worker and and a smart guy like brad's also a guy that knows how to work on his stuff and you know you see him at the racetrack on the tractor on whatever he's got to do right he's a get it done guy and um i just think you have a really really strong team there and and i also think you know that the sport can sustain it right now. It, yeah, I agree. It's, there's a there's a lot of great cars out there. Streaming has doubled the size of the sport. Like when we were sitting down looking at budgets and made the decision to go high limit racing, and I plugged in the purses and all that into you know the same budget I used when I was racing full time ten years ago, and looked at it and said like, look, this pencil's better than racing in California and going out on the road a little bit like this actually pencils better if we go do the high limit deal and what i saw there is he's they're racing for twice the purse money that i was racing for 10 years ago (laughs) twice like not just a little more twice yeah the amount so um i think the sport can support it right now i think you know the outlaws are as strong as they've ever been i think that high limits is going to be strong and you know ultimately for us the high limit schedule works for Corey's schedule. Like he's still out of finished school. So, you know, us being out, that's why we're not out chasing the outlaws right now. Corey's finishing up his senior year in school and doing his, doing his work. And that's first, you know, that's first and foremost before anything racing comes along. So the high limit schedule just really works for us. So having your own business with, with Myers wasn't enough and a race team and all this stuff. So you, so you go out and get Sanders. So yeah, you get involved in racing with a, with a product, with a product company. How did that come about? And, and what's that been like? I know you hustle. I've seen you, I've seen you, uh, you know, PRI, I've, I've talked to you, obviously I've seen you, uh, I, was it world finals? Were you down there? I think somewhere. I saw uh, you. Uh, yeah. 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 And you were talking to guys. What made you kind of take over that? undertaking so with sander when i left the road in 2012 glenn was one of the first people i went and talked to i grew up in a machine shop um you know i love racing and wanted to remain being a part of racing so i went down and talked to glenn and and asked him like would you sell your business 
And uh, he said, well, yeah, actually, I think I would. And so we talked and we talked through things. And at that time, as I kind of did my analysis and looked at it, I didn't see how I could move the business out of L.A. to Fresno because there were so many proprietary processes of, you know, from the heat treating to uh, mainly heat treating was a big one. And then polishing and all the things you got to do to make a good wheel um, and make a finished wheel. A lot of those things are in L.A. Well, you come to Fresno, there's not a heat treater that can do that. There's not a polishing company that can do it. Um there's uh, even just sourcing the material, you know, much simpler down in L.A. And um, so I didn't see how I could move it to Fresno. And I thought, well, I just left the profession that I love to be home with my kids, not to move to L.A. Right. <laughs> I left to be home and, and I could have moved my family, of course. But I mean, you know, my wife is excited about come back home and be and so was I to be where grandma and grandpa are, and have a babysitter for the first time in five years and. And, and for our kids to be able to, yeah, and we want our kids to grow up around their grandparents, right? So um, so I decided not to do it at that point. And then I went into, actually, I went into the landscape business with Guy for about 18 months. That wasn't really my cup of tea. And then my dad and I had been talking the whole time, too. And then I got involved with my dad for a few years and then ultimately started our own construction company, my wife and I, in 2016. So that being said, every two years about Glenn called me and said, Hey, are you still interested in my business? Right. And my answer was always the same. It was, yeah, Glenn, I'm interested, but man, my plate's really full. And, um, so that conversation happened again, two years ago in Knoxville, actually Doug Lane brought it up to me that, Hey, I heard that Glenn, you know, Glenn's maybe still thinking about selling. I'm like, yeah, he actually called me <laughs> a few months ago and asked if I was still interested. And, and right about that time, like, you know, I got a great team that we've built in the construction business and, I, I had just a few seconds of time on my hands, right, which I can't seem to stand <laughs> and uh, thought to myself, like, you know what, maybe I could do this now. So um, I went back down and talked to him. And by this point, like I had figured out some different ways of like, OK, well, we could do polishing in-house and the heat treating. You know, we can we can actually spin the wheels down here, get them heat treated, then bring them to Fresno. So like we, we started figuring out the logistics of it. And, uh, and once again, you know, technology changes, things change over time. And, and, um, so for me, it's, it's, uh, I, I grew up in a machine shop. I love it. I love the CNC side of things. I, in our Myers constructors, we started out as wood framing. Now we do tr structural steel as well. And we got lots of technology and machinery that does that. And we're creating actually machinery and processes to automate framing as well. And, um, I enjoy that stuff. And so, um, so I started thinking real serious about it. And once again, like you're going to see this common theme of people, it's um, always because people. I believe that that's what makes it always happen. And so I came home, we were at a race. I think we were at the outlaw race in September. And, um, this was after Knoxville. I had gone and I talked to Glenn back, uh, in 2023 and, uh, I'm sorry, 2022. And we're at the outlaw race and, I have a machinist friend of mine that I've known for 30 years that when I learned how to CNC program when I was a kid, he was somebody that kind of I would call and ask questions and he would help me out and guide me through when I got stuck. And I thought, you know, I know I kind of heard through the grapevine that he's wanting to do something else. Like I should call him and ask if he just helped me on the side, like just do programming for me. And I'd been thinking about this. So we're at the outlaw show and the night gets over and Corey ran really well. I think we were top three or four or five or something like that. And, and, uh, his name's John. John comes down and he comes up and taps me on the shoulder. He says, Hey, stranger. And I said, Hey, how you doing? Yeah. I said, man, I've been meaning to call you. Like I've been thinking about you every day, meaning to call you. And so I told him about Sander and what I was thinking about doing. And he's like, I'd love it. I'd love to help you. And I'm like, well, there's my answer, right? <laughs> like I got the guy. And, uh, and I'd also talked to uh, both Rod and Jaron Bandy who are related to Dan Bandy, who's my CPA, good friend of mine. Um, and I've known, I've known Rod a little bit, but more so no Dan and they had a Chrome shop. They were wanting to shut down. So like, okay, here's a building we could put it in. Here's two guys that want something else to do that already have a polishing facility for the Chrome, which we can convert right to the wheels. Like it just, I mean, I think in 48 hours, it all came together. So, um, so I went down and talked to Glenn that, and I mean, it took us probably a month and a half or so to put it together, but we got it done. As deals go, that's not too bad. Throughout your whole career, whether it was the race team, your businesses, 
uh, the current Rays team, it seems like it's all about putting the right people in place. And I think that's something I say this about sprint car teams all the time. You could have the most money. You could have the smartest crew chief and the best driver. And it doesn't always work because for whatever reason, the chemistry you've always been able to put people together. And it seems like that's the biggest takeaway from basically everything you've done the last 22 years. Well, and I think at the end of the day, it's what I enjoy. Like it's what I'm passionate about. I love putting great people together and then giving them, Um, I believe in servant leadership. I believe in leading them through like, if I can help you be successful, then I'll naturally be successful. Like I don't go to work every day trying to figure out how I can make more money or how I can become more famous or how I can be more successful. I go with the idea of how do we make everybody here successful? And if we do that, then our success will naturally be a result of that. And, you know, that's worked really, it's, I don't do that because I think that's the best way of success. I do that because I think that's the right way to live life. And I think the result of living life the right way, working hard, putting the effort in, and not only believing in people, but supporting people, the result of that is the success. And, um, you know, we've been, we've been very blessed with lots of great people, lots of good opportunities. And, uh, and when those opportunities have come along, we've been willing to step up and put the work in to make it happen. And, and, you know, I bumped my head again here this year and Jacob Gopin and I partnered and, and uh, took over the lease to Plaza Park Raceway here in Visalia. So we got something else on our plate now. And uh, but once again, the right people like partnering with Jake on this and, uh, you know, we, the the team that was on board there that kind of handled the track was already a great team. And being able to pull the other relationships we have and Ken Autry with Autry Plumbing and and uh, uh Phil with Fowler packing, just all these people were able to pull together. I mean, we took the lease over February 1st and completely rebuilt the racetrack and had our opening night in eight weeks and, and, uh, or at least six weeks actually to opening night. And then we just had the KKM challenge a couple weeks ago. So again, you can't do that without great people. You just, you can't, you can't turn something around that quick. You can't make things come together that fast. And so, that for me is, you know, my wife tells me all the time, like, God, you burn people out, you know? And it's like, look, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not burning people out. Like I tell her, I'm showing people that they can do things that they didn't think they could do. Right. Like that. And I, and I truly am like, I, I believe that if someone says, Oh, I don't think we can get that done. I say, yes, we can. Yes, we can watch. Let's here's how we do it. We work together. We get this done. It's going to be tough. And, uh, but I like working with those kinds of people and it's not for everybody. And there's nothing wrong if it's not for you, you know, it's, yes, it is crazy. It's long hours, but that's, that's the adrenaline part of it. You know, that's the, it's been really, really hard after retiring from racing to find something to replace that adrenaline and, and business, you know, taking things and turning them around and making them great. You get a little bit of taste. It's not quite the same, but it's close. And, um, and the enjoyment of, you know, when you're in racing, you're building teams. That's what you're doing. And yeah, you got to be a great driver and you got to have a good equipment, and, but that good equipment. And well, like when we started building our own chassis and people wanted to buy ch- and we wouldn't sell them. Right. And, and I explained to some people like me selling you a chassis is not going to do anything for you. Even if I sold you one, it's not going to do anything unless you buy the shocks, the wing, the front axle, And then you need the team that knows how to make the right decisions at the right time to make it all happen. Right. So it's really about the combination of both people and, and, uh, and components, but, you know, people remember people make those components. So it really, it really all goes back to people. And uh, we've been blessed with some great people. And at the end of the day, people ask me all the time, do I miss racing? Do I miss the road? Well, Let's be honest. Who misses the road? Uh, (laughs) Do I, do I miss racing? I I don't necessarily miss racing. Like I loved it. I I was passionate about it and um, I don't miss it because as you, you made the comment, like I don't have regrets. I made a decision to turn the page and move to the next chapter of my life. And, and I'm in the next chapter and I'm loving it. I'm in the next chapter with my family and our business and all the great people that we have met and, and built relationships with. So no, I don't miss it. But what you do miss is you miss the people. You know, I've got friends all over the country and relationships with them that we used to see them two, three, four times a year. And now we might see them once every three or four years. So it's why I still go to Knoxville every year. Um, I think I've been every year except for one since I retired from full-time racing. 
and because it's the best place in the country to see almost everybody. And uh, cause that's what you miss. Yep. You know, that transition when we came home is you just, you miss the people. Well, that's a great place to stop. I mean, you, you've had a, an interesting 22 years, an exhausting one, <laughs> but it seems like it's been, it seems like it's been uh, very beneficial to you and your family. I think it's, yeah, it has. And um, I hope that it's also not just been beneficial to me and my family, but beneficial to a lot of people that have been a part of, of what we've been a part of and um, what we, you know, what I've been able to do, what my wife, what my family has been able to do is because of all of those people. And I, and I not only hope, but I know that many of them feel the same and, and, you know, it's fun to, we make memories together, whether it's success or failure, we've, we've made memories together and we've learned from those things and, and yeah, no regrets, learn from it, move on and, and get better. Well, Jason, I want to thank you very much for taking the time uh, to be on the show and uh, especially, you know, while your, your son's, I guess, practicing basketball. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he's got my energy. He's racing, he's playing <laughs> basketball. He's nonstop, nonstop. Well, that'll keep you busy. But again, thank you very much for being on the show. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy. Yep. That's going to wrap up this edition of the SprintCarLimited.com Deep Dive presented by Entrust IT Solutions. First and foremost, thank you to Jason Myers for being on the show. It was good stuff. Also, don't forget to click the subscribe button on our YouTube channel and check out our daily exclusive content at www.SprintCarLimited.com. We'll be back with another edition of the Deep Dive next Thursday. Stay tuned.